Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 184, featuring the third part of my interview with Mr. Joel Billings, the founder of SSI, and the man responsible for this game right here, Pool of Radiance, one of the best computer role-playing games of all time, launched the epic gold box series that defined late 80s role-playing games, and I to be honest, I don't think it's ever been equaled. We chat about that series, of course. We also talk about the Dark Sun series and another one of SSI's great games, Panzer General. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Joel Billings. <laughs> well, I'm a huge fan of uh, the Gold Box games. I got my favorite one back there, Pool of Radiance. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked a little bit about you know getting this license, but I wonder if you could... To sort of put me in the room with uh, you and TSR as you're trying to hash out what this game is going to be like. Well, we we came to them, if I remember, with a definite plan of, okay, we're going to do this gold box series of games which are going to be you know tactical combat. Uh, front and foremost, as you're walking around, you're going to be fighting these tactical battles. And... And then we had also the Silver Box series, which we had our partner U.S. Gold in England who had, was willing to do an arcade-ish type game. And then we wanted to do the Dungeon Master's Assistant programs for people who were playing the, the paper game. So we came to them with this complete series. So unlike other companies, which were basically saying, well, yeah, we want the license and we'll do one game will make a D and D game. We were saying, no, you know, we're going to do this all these different kinds of games, and we're not just going to do one D and D game. We're going to do the, goal, you know, a whole series of, of gold box games. So, uh, and then we did it in different worlds. We did Forgotten Realms as we started with, you know, then we went to the what the Dragonlance uh, with, the, with the different worlds. I'm trying to remember what they were, but you know, so we had the different gold box series. So that was, I think, what sold them on it was the idea that, you know, we weren't just going to do one game and then forget, and then that's it, that's the license, or maybe one game and a sequel. We were going to start right off with a plan for three different lines of product. One of the other developers I, or designers I interviewed, I talked about how he was doing role-playing games uh, before the Gold Box series. It's just one sort of one-guy operation. Mm -hmm. now, so he visited SSI's offices uh, when they were making uh, when you were making a pool of radiance and he was just amazed at how many different people were working on it yeah i think you said there was a person dedicated just for the manual you know okay. yeah <laughs> I mean, so this was a pretty expansive operation you had going here. yeah it, it really changed the ssi had about 35 employees i think when uh we uh went to get the license in 87 and you know and maybe, I don't know, we might have had only 10 or 15 people in development, in, in research and development, because we had everything, we had production and, and, you know, all that. So I remember as soon as we got the license, we were able to hire, start hiring more developers. We hired artists at that point before, it, it might have been, it might have been with the license, we hired our first artist, or we might have had one artist uh, right before that, and then we started hiring computer artists. I mean, before that, it was the, the people who were submitting the games for us did all their art. And the, even the internal games that we did, it was programmer art, or I think at that point, we maybe had one artist. So yeah, we started to build. So the gold box game, you know, with, with uh, Full of Radiance was a real change for SSI. Suddenly we were working on games that, you know, most we'd have two programmers. Most games had one programmer. Wizards Crown had two programmers. Now we were dealing with two, three, four programmers for different parts of the game, uh, artists, a whole art team. So yeah, it, it, it definitely changed. And because of the success of the Gold Box and the its ability to just crank them out uh, one after the other, we were able to you know get a team of scripters. You had the guys building the basically the encounters and you know the story behind the game. And you had the programmers, you had the artists, you had the developers who were working on it. So yeah very different so within a couple of years we went from a development team of you know maybe 10 people and suddenly we were 30 40 people and we had teams that you know we were used to be two or three people and now they were suddenly you know 10 people working on a project 12 people so yeah a big big change let me see if i if i still have this if it's in here yeah there's uh, something i wanted to ask you uh Oh, Joel, do you remember this? I do. 
Yeah. <laughs> Whose idea was this? Right. <laughs> the that code was the wheel system. Right. Right. Was that a pool of radiance? Yes. Oh, okay. Wonder if that's when it started. If that was the first game where we did that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. What was the rationale behind that? I mean, obviously it was for copy protection, but right. I mean, was that the only uh, reason for, to put it in? I think that was the main reason. I, I, I'm trying to remember. I hardly remember it, but uh, somebody must have come up with a neat idea. Let, let, let's do a decoder wheel and, and put, but didn't it have like different characters on it or that are unique, like sort of D&D &D kinds? Yeah, at certain parts of the game, you'd get a message and it would be in rune form and you could translate it with that. Right. So, uh, yeah, I don't remember how that came about, uh, to be honest, but it was uh, kind of a cool way to get protection into the game and you know copy bootleg yeah bootleg copying copying this was so easy back then <laughs> that bootlegs were just rampant and uh oh i mean i remember going to a game show uh in it was like the west coast computer fair in san francisco and somebody came up to me and he was ragging on us about one at our booth about one of our games about some bug in this game and i'm i'm thinking wait a minute that bug was like five versions before the game was released. This guy had a bootleg test version of the game, and he's complaining about that. So, so you know, even our testing at the time was, which was basically mailing uh, uh, in the very early days, it was mailing uh, discs out to people around the country. And one of our biggest testers turned out to be a huge bootlegger. And uh, so you get these, so test discs were getting bootlegged everywhere. So, so that was that was tough. Yeah. Well, did the code wheel help help with the piracy? I, I hope I assume it did. Yeah, <laughs> I assume that's what it did. So, it was clearly. I mean, Pool of Radiance was uh, an order of magnitude bigger seller than you know anything we had done before. It was it was huge. So, and we. I had, think that was just the effect of the license, or was it? Oh, it was a combination. I mean, the license was big, and the fact that this was really the first Dungeons and Dragons product out there—that was a huge thing. But the game was good, so you know you had the best of both worlds. You had a huge license with a ready-made market of interested people, and then you had a good game. So, yeah, when that happened with that, and then Eye of the Beholder, I think was the other game that just shot, you know, off the charts. You know, we just blew through what we had in inventory, you know, in, in a, the first couple of weeks. So the point where we were, you know, totally out. I mean, that never happened, you know, to be out of games for a couple of weeks and the market was just blowing thousands of them. So those those two games were both, you know, uh, the, the Eye of the Beholder came along and was really one of the first, you know, th first person, what would be first person shooter, but it's first person D&D, &D, you know, not shooter, D&D &D game. So, and it had really nice graphics for it as well. So... Uh, those two games were really the two, and then uh, on the war game side, Panzer General was the one that did the same thing. So it just blew the socks off the market. I'm wondering uh, how much interference or involvement uh, did TSR have with you when you were working on these games? Uh, it was a good relationship, actually, from a development point of view. Uh, there were some people there, and uh, Jim Ward was our became our main contact uh, with uh, the uh, from TSR on the development side. So there was a lot of good stuff. I mean, Pool of Radiance, he actually, Jim Ward, wrote a book uh, and published, they published Pool of Radiance as a book. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah, and I guess I was the guy who suggested it at the time, but, you know, they ought to write a book for it. But uh, he, was, he was really helpful. He was involved, and, you know, they were making good royalties off of it from us, so you know, they he devoted a certain amount of his time to working with our guys. So I'd say early on, especially, it was a really good uh, development relationship. So you know, I think there was a certain amount of they wanted to make sure that their license was you know treated well, and you know they came across well. But they saw right away. I mean, one of the reasons why they went with us was we. We just got along, you know. The two development groups got along because they were gamers. I mean, the TSR guys were a bunch of gamers too. So, so uh, we all had, you know, the same idea about what we wanted to do. So, so that was that was good. It was a good relationship. And I don't remember, although they probably had some 
rights, you know, ability to say yes or no to stuff or, you know, it, it was never really an issue. I mean, we had to get things approved, but it was, you know, uh, Chuck did a good job of managing that relationship. And so it worked well. I understand you had some issues with a Japanese port of the game. We had the, right, there was a, a Nintendo version that we were trying to get done. It was a Pony Canyon, I think, was the name of the company. So we had very early on, one of the ways we did the, the whole D&D thing was uh, we knew it was going to cost a lot of money, one, to get the license, two, to get the development going on the product. And we were, you know, we were funded with forty thousand dollars, as I said, <laughs> and so we we did not have huge backing behind us, and uh, so at that point, uh, the way we did it was we went out and we got the Japanese company to put up rights for a Nintendo version and basically pay us a big advance, and U.S. Gold, if I remember right, paid us an advance, and so we took that money and we were able to use that to fund the development work. And, and get the license. So it was all, it all came together, all to, you know, it all needed to come together. The, the unfortunate part was, you know, the good part was U.S. Gold went ahead and did a, gold, a silver game on time and, you know, came out and did all right. But the Pony Canyon, they struggled uh, with doing the Nintendo game. And it, it took them years. And I think they finally put something out, but it was, you know, we just missed the whole video game marketplace. And that, that was that was unfortunate. And you know, in hindsight, you say you wish you know we would have gone with somebody else or done something else. But at the same time, we needed the money that their that that license represented in order to fund all the gold box development that we were going to be doing. So, so it, you know, it was one of those things. We got something, but we lost something. And we mentioned uh, the Westwood, of course, did the Eye of the Beholder games. I'm wondering why uh, you didn't do that one in house. Uh, what kind of relationship did you have with Westwood? Uh, Westwood had done a bunch of games for us, and I think the interesting thing is they started as a as a port house. They they were porting games from one computer to another. So early on, I think the first things they did for us were were ports of games, maybe to the Amiga or something like that. And then the uh, they I, I don't remember what else they did, but you know Chuck had a good relationship with the guys at Westwood. And basically, they uh, at some point I, I don't remember if they did some other game for us before Eye of the Beholder, but uh, other than the ports, but uh, they came up with the idea of doing it. And you know, like I said, we were still primarily getting most of our games from the outside. The Gold Box series became the staple internal product that that's what we did internally, but everything else we were publishing was coming from the outside. So. It was just normal for us to, you know, have somebody propose that. And you ask, why didn't we do that? Well, I don't know. I guess you could ask that about a lot of games, games that became popular or game genres that became popular. Why didn't we think of that? It's like Combat Leader. Well, you know, we did have a guy who thought of that kind of game, but we didn't know how to move it forward. Or we didn't have the talent to do it internally. So, and it's a different kind of gaming, too. You know, we were... Again, we were very combat oriented, tactical, you know, the uh, miniatures kind of combat oriented and not graphically, you know, the, the real time graphics was not something we were big on, you know, ourselves or had any special ability with. I mean, I'd still be happy if you had continued to release gold box games. <laughs> I know a lot of people. I'd still be buying them if they were right. uh, being put out there. Yeah. Well, let's uh, talk about the. I'm actually wondering uh, where Panzer General fits in. I don't have a year for that written down here. It's uh, 1994. 1994. And you say that was the biggest game of all? I think it's the biggest war game of all, the biggest selling computer war game of all time. I'll, I'll make that statement. And uh, somebody can prove me wrong, but I think that's true, that it was probably the biggest computer war game, or, you know, war game ever sold in terms of number of units. And where that fits in is that it was because of the failure of our moving the gold box engine quickly to the second generation engine. We were, you know, the gold box was getting old from a, a technology point of view, and we wanted to do a new engine. And Dark Sun was a new world that TSR was doing. And so we thought, okay, we'll, we'll do 
uh, Dark Sun uh, in a new generation graphics view, but it'll be the gold box storytelling type of game. Well, that project was supposed to take a year, which everything at SSI up to that point had nothing had taken more than a year, including the gold box uh, pool of radiance. Well, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, and it took two years. And after a year, a uh, year and a half, we were really struggling because we needed that game to come out. It was a huge investment. And we not only invested in that, but we also were working on a Nintendo version of it. Uh, so Paul Murray was put in charge of doing the uh, programming of the Nintendo version. And we also had a science fiction game, which was uh, going to come out using the same engine uh, that the, uh, this, this Dark Sun was going to be. So we were putting all our eggs in this one technological basket, and it wasn't coming out on time. And so we ended up going through some hard times. We had a layoff at one point in 1993. And we had to say, okay, what's important? Uh, all right, we're going to cancel the sci-fi game. We're going to cancel the Nintendo game. We're just going to do Dark Sun and you know, finish that up. And I think Keith was the hero of that one, actually. He sort of got put in charge of, okay, you know, we got to get this thing done in the next you know, six to nine months. And you know, let's focus all our efforts on that. And Paul was there having you know, no Nintendo project, but you know, Paul was a... a a designer of, uh, you know, done many games for us over the years. So we're thinking what, what to do. And Chuck, I don't know who came up with the idea, but Chuck and uh, some of the guys, Dan and Brad, I think, in development, had been playing a game called Dyson Ra Ryuku, Dyson Raiku from Japan on, uh, on a video game system. And they really liked it. It was a war game, a simple war game. And they thought, you know, we could do that game, you know, something like it, same idea, you know, a series of simple battles in World War II. And so uh, they, they pitched the idea of putting Paul in charge of that. It would be a small team. Paul would be the, the main programmer on it and uh, uh, go forward. So that happened in uh, 90, early 93, that project started. Best move we ever made, best decision we ever made, because... He was able to finish that, you know, in late 94. It just, it became an instant bestseller. And everybody, that, that game became a labor of love at SSI for everybody. I mean, uh, it seems like everybody in development uh, uh, was involved in it. Chuck pulled the old Tom Sawyer, uh, Huck Finn thing on me. He, you know, the thing about painting the fence, uh, I guess he gets all the other kids to paint the fence for him when, he, you know, he got me so sucked into doing it that I ended up working on the, uh, the the campaign tree. So I basically designed the campaign tree for the game, and you know, in my in my spare time, and uh, uh, and then uh, we had a a voice. The idea was to have a voice actor, which we'd never done before, but we were going to have a voice actor speak, uh, you know, German accent, be the German general, your boss between missions. And so I wrote the voice scripts for all of that. Never done that before. So, uh, and I think Brett was involved. In, you know, a lot of the development, the high-level development people in the company basically put their time and resources and energy into it. So it, it became just a total labor of love. And I think the game showed it. And so that was a 100% internal SSI with all the best people working on it, I think. So... That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week, probably with Augustin Cordez. He's got a new Kickstarter coming out about his uh, game Asylum. Now, you might remember we chatted about that uh, with him on this show a couple years ago. Well, the game is almost made now. Just needs a little over $100,000, $666 more dollars uh, to be precise, uh, to get that game out of production and into our hard drive. So uh, please, I'll put a link in the show notes if you'd like to go check it out now. But uh, we'll have him on next time to tell us all about it. So stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and supported or subscribed to the show. I really it means a lot to me guys uh, the audience for this kind of stuff is very selective i dare say uh, but those of us who love this stuff really love it so thank you very much for supporting the show 
Unfortunately, I had no ale uh, this week. I uh, got caught in a bit of a snowstorm, <laughs> actually. Uh, so, just going to have to uh, muddle through without it. Uh, I do have a quotation, though, so all is not lost. And the quotation uh, comes from a certain tank commander by the name of Edwin Rommel. And it goes something like this. In a man-to-man -man fight, the winner is he who has one more bullet in his magazine. See you guys next week. You just got your asses whipped by a bunch of goddamn nerds. Nerds!